everybody welcome in welcome in i am andy this is my studio today we will talk about ableton and we will talk about it from the uh, the viewpoint of the artist who has acquired ableton maybe has been using ableton for a little while decided i'm all in i'm getting one of these push things and we are really going to get down to business and so what do i need to know what do i not need to know like What's the, the basic overall thing here? Because, you know, uh, artist time is a bit limited. you got a gig coming up. Uh, all this came uh, to fruition, really. Um, I had a stream like this to do, but my pal Ellie Mac on uh, Twitch, Ellie Mac Music, go check her out. She's awesome, super talented human being, and super patient and friendly human being, too. She's doing this production stuff on stream and getting a lot of advice. Good advice from smart people, but some advice that's, you know, not right, quite relevant to the thing that you're doing, and you know, it was a really good illustration to me of how easy it is in this world to get sidetracked away from kind of, you know, just the, the nuts and bolts and nitty gritty of what you're trying to do and what you or what you need to do because, you know, this artist, like many of us, is on a time budget. It's a gig coming up in a couple of days. We got this new device, this controller, that is gonna allow me as the artist to go into Ableton and perform this piece that I've built in arrangement view. And so I, you know, I simply want to take it out of arrangement view, put it into session view, kind of loop it up a bit, um, which she did and had a great method of doing so. And then she ends up with several scenes. And so in Ableton scenes the, are the rows, you know, that's a great first thing to know. See that cursor moving up and down through there and turning things <clears throat> a lighter color of gray. That is uh, a row and it's a scene. So, I have the sections of the song. This song is one of our songs, my, one of my songs from, uh, it's like a stream song about uh, bananas. Everybody, you know, it's just a funny thing. So we can, it's like a rock song. It's got an intro, verses, chorus, breaks, all that kind of stuff. So I can step through here and go hit my trigger. And what I'm doing, if we have a look down from the top, uh, what I'm doing is I'm hitting, I've got two controls, an up and a down key, learn to the up and down, you know, controls in the Ableton Learn thing when you turn on MIDI Learn. And then this one to the launch, the launch control, like for each track. Um, those are, whoops, don't do that. Those controls are, if I turn on the MIDI overlay, whoops, turn on the MIDI overlay, put you back where you belong. You can see uh, we've got a new a new thing up here, this little play button. That's the launch control for each uh, channel. And so that is learned to this M audio little uh, two-way trigger here, or two, two point, whatever, AB trigger. It's like a sustain pedal, more or less. And uh, But that's connected to those. And then over here on the master channel, we have where these point sevens are. Those are uh, controller number things for, uh, the uh, up and down keys, these two right here. So those are mapped to these arrow buttons and that's what allows me to move that cursor up and down through my project and change scenes, basically. So I'll move it around, hit the trigger, move it around, hit the trigger, hit the trigger. Easy peasy. It's like, and what am I doing there? Move it around, hit the trigger. Move it around, hit the trigger, hit the trigger, stop it, start it. Foot controllers are grand in that way. Um, and so that's how uh, I use it in, in the fashion and why I use it. And so um, that's, uh, you know, kind of what we're working with. I should say. So you might be working with something similar. Regardless, you can totally set up, you know, a couple of tracks, a couple of loops, and accomplish kind of all the same things that we're going to talk about, right? So let's get into it. Why should you listen to me? Um, I because there's so many people saying all these same things. I've been doing this a long time, 20 plus years. I like to move fast through stuff, so I'm gonna I'm gonna hopefully save you time as I go through this stuff and show you what these things are and what you need to worry about or not worry about, and hopefully just save you a little time. You might learn something. Who knows? And uh, <clears throat> but like I said, doing 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 this a very long time. Do I do stuff professionally? Sure. Uh, what have I sent out recently? Well, I, I've sent stuff to uh, Hulu this week. I've sent stuff to Netflix a couple weeks ago. Um, we had you know last year Nickelodeon, year before Nickelodeon, uh, big YouTuber had stuff go to him uh, a month ago. 
stuff's going out as it always has in my entire career to all over the place if you want to hear about or hear my music mixing you know type what i've done in here with this studio like for my personal music go to my band camp it's out there too just google it you'll find it um it's all free it's all there you can totally check it out so now you are uh you know got that out of the way you can listen to this guy he's not going to waste my time uh, hopefully <laughs> too bad right so what are we dealing with we're dealing with ableton we're dealing with the push controller rock and roll so let's start right here with the push what do i need to know well that one right there it's the play button right seems a pretty good place to start perfect right above that is the record button uh, these do exactly what you think. You will notice the record button. Occasionally you have to push it twice to get it going. Sometimes record or to get it out of record mode. Um, it, uh, the record functions in Ableton uh, are based around the looping, I think, is what's going on. And sometimes the record button instantiates, or whatever that word is, gets the clip happening, and then the next record press actually gets things going and going into it. Above that is Automate. I've never used it. I've used uh, Ableton for a year doing uh, a lot of these looped up productions on stream, and yeah, I've never used it. Fixed length, very important. It's why we bought the push. I know there's people out there saying that with me. Um, you can't do fixed length loop recording like this without the push. Um, I guess that's how they get you. And basically, uh, you have to have, if you don't have a push, like before I had a push, I had I used this, which was just a little 25 key controller that I had for traveling and such like that, or for using in the house. And uh, I noticed when I got Ableton, I was like, oh, hey, this thing is already kind of set up to work with Ableton. So uh, this, like any other MIDI controller, um, it's going to have the same thing. So there was two buttons to go up and down through the scenes, again, like I do with the foot controller, and then a button to launch. And really, that's the whole, you could have three just little simple MIDI button foot things and plug them all to your thing and have one to up, one to down, and one to launch, and you're good to go. Now, if you don't have a push, you're going to need a fourth, and that fourth is one to stop. And so that's where uh, it got annoying for me. I'd much rather, and as many people, I'd much rather set it to be a four-bar loop and know that when it gets to the end of that, it's just going to roll back on itself, just like the boss loopers do, um, like people are used to with looping. And so that's why I have the push. But turns out it's so, so, so much more. So let's keep going. Fixed length. If it's blinking like this one is, that means it's on. And so it's very important to make sure that that's selected if you want to be doing fixed length. If you hold it down, you can see your options across the top. Everything from one beat to 32 bars. And uh, up on, on up, we have duplicate. Does just what you think. It'll duplicate clips, tracks, whatever. Hold it, and then do your duplicating thing. So we want to du duplicate that to there. Done. Uh, delete, same thing. Hold it. Hit your thing. Deletes way up at the top. That's duplicate. Quantize. If you click it and hold it, you'll see your quantize option shows up here. Record quantize on. Quantize to 1 16th. So that means as you record in, it's your playheads moving across and it's going to be quantizing behind it as it goes all the way along. So that when it comes back around, all that stuff will now be quantized, which is very handy. You'll like it. If you didn't quantize on the way in, you can uh, go into your clip and then hit that quantize button and boom, everything will quantize. Above that, we have mute solo stop clip. Don't concern yourself with these. Um, they're handy, sure. They kind of work like press it, hold it, hit your track. It'll turn it on and off. It works with this toggle where the numbers are in orange, yellow, down through the mixer here, 5, 6, not 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, all that. It turns those on and off, basically. And I, I say avoid it if you're, not, if you're a new user, especially if you're going into a live performance, because it, it, those buttons, mute and solo, have a hold function. Like if you press an, a lock function, if you press it too long, it goes into like mute lock and good luck. If you get your stuff stuck in those lock modes that you don't even know what they are or how to work them while you're in the middle of live stuff. I've done that. It was not fun. So uh, that's that. Stay away from it for now. Undo just what does just what you think. Delete does too. Hold it before you try and delete something. Hold to delete. Delete. You're done. Tap tempo up above. Just what you think. Tap your tempo in, and you can set it with a knob right above it directly. Metronome. Turn it on and off. Easy peasy. Um, the knobs across the top are, you know, they do the volume, etc. If we hit this mix button over here, and I should say every time I come into the uh, to the push. You know, it might look like this when I turn things on. The first thing I'm going to do is hit session, and then I'm going to hit mix. 
boom, I had to hit master because master was selected. Um, all of these buttons, for the most part, are two-way toggles. Master on, master off. Mix on, mix off. Well, not really. These go between different modes, too. A few modes for the display. But with mix mode on, we have these knobs become our volumes, our pans, our sends. And that's super handy to not have to mess with a mouse to do all that stuff. See what I'm saying? The push is so much more. You got a hands-on mixer chilling right here for you. So uh, next on over, setup. In there, you can find uh, what's useful is the pad sensitivity curves. I have mine set to five. I've tried a bunch of stuff, and I kind of like it the way it is. Pressure, mono poly. I don't even know what that is. That's probably very useful. I'm going to have to look into that. LED brightness uh, is turned way down, so actually right now, so you can see this stuff on video. That's all that's there. User, I don't know what's in user mode. What I don't know what that is. But we'll turn it back off. Shan't we? What, let's use your internal knob. Yeah, nothing happened. Uh, below that, you have your mix, device, browse, and clip. They do just what you want. This one shows you a mixer. This one shows you what's on the device of the currently selected track. Browse lets you add things, which is super fun. It's very easy to add any of your plugins, any of that stuff from right here. It'll add a new track. Boom, it writes right in there. Um, these two buttons right over here, add device, add track. You can add devices to tracks. You can add tracks to projects. How easy. Clip shows you what you're working on. There it is. And that also turns all these buttons up here into, you know, all these different things. You know, like how awesome. And so... Uh, you know, uh, that reminds me right there. I, I saw uh, this warp thing is right here. So uh, that reminds me. <coughs> Excuse me, choking. That reminds me on the stream that I was watching yesterday with Ellie Mac. Uh, this big question about warp came up. And uh, it's like quite a diversion from anything necessary at all. Uh, warping is basically, and this is funny to me because I just went through this. Um, I had a project that I sent out for a Netflix thing. That was a bunch of guitar parts, and uh, I just happened to do it in Ableton. I'd been doing stuff on in Ableton on the stream, and I was like, yeah, cool. Let's just do it in this. I like Ableton. Off it goes. Uh, my buddy sends it back. He's like, yo, this is jacked up. Sounds great, but it doesn't line up. And I'm like, what do you mean? 118? It does. Try again. He's like, nope, you try again. That doesn't work. It's like, okay, shit. Pull it up in my other DAW, Digital Performer, and uh, yeah, sure enough, it's out of whack. A half a day later, I figure out that what Ableton does is it turns on by default this warp feature when you import the audio clip that's going to warp it to your tempo or whatever and so i had the right tempos and stuff but it definitely warped it like out of out of the bpm that it was supposed to be on by like some fraction of a bpm that i couldn't really uh <clears throat> hear with my ears i was checking stuff i was like this all sounds right it sounds great i couldn't hear it but the the daws definitely noticed and uh that was because of this warping feature. So if you don't want to have your things time stretched and whatnot, you just want to set tempo, you know, like this artist I'm talking about, Ellie Mack, uh, turning out this track that she'd already produced and turning it into loops. You don't want any of that warp stuff turned on for for sure, not at all. Um, and I mean, these guys were getting into talking about how to add, you know, set your warp points and stuff. So here's what warp does. Warp is super awesome and cool for the right application. It will take any waveform that you bring into Ableton, any audio file, and basically change its tempo to be the tempo that you want it to be of your project. And uh, if and Ableton's really good at doing this, it, you know, I, I, I don't see it fail that often. But if it does, if you throw something a little too complicated at it, you can even tell it what point you want it to warp at. And that's where this conversation had got to, like, which is way off, off track um, for sure. But it's a very good thing to know that the, the warp feature, you know, like, uh, doesn't need to be on if you've imported a bunch of loops. Now, you can see, like, if I show you up in my Raven right now, warp is on for uh, this, like, bass track right here. And so it's warping to the exact same BPM as this uh, project does. And maybe since I, it's not really warping is the point. Um, and since this file originated in this project, that might all just work out and line up just fine. But I know from my experience, when I had did what I outlined before, you know, imported some a stem and, and <laughs> worked on it and sent it back, God, it was it was out of whack. Didn't work. That was the work. So uh, back to the push. 
So we've almost made it uh, all the way around our push. Over here we have the main launch key, so you can hit these. And you're gonna kick those off. Now, how does it decide when it's gonna start playing that next thing, right? I'll tell you. It decides how it's gonna play, be playing that next thing by whatever you have set in your quantization menu up here, is what they call it. I don't know why they call it a quantization menu. It doesn't have much to do with your actual quantization. But so, if I have this set to one bar and my time is in 4-4, four, four, that means in four counts, it's going to go. Three, you got four counts. So you'll be on like one, and off you go. If you do it before those last four counts, it's going to go four counts early. I don't think that makes sense. So that's all well and great. As long as all your loops are 4 and 8 and 16 and 32, Ableton loves that. If you've got a 5-bar loop mixed in there, you got a scene that's all 5-bar loops. It doesn't know what to do with that, usually. Um, or uh, just different weird sizes. And that often happens because people like to make songs that don't fit exactly into 4 bars, 4 bars. You know, I do all the time. I like a little thing on the end of the verse or a little thing before the chorus. Um, but so, as does Queen. Uh, so... And some other stuff, Africa that I've looped up, looped up. Both of those on my YouTube channel are both cases where it falls into non-cushy triggering. So when you have it set to one bar, that's like to me cushy triggering. You've got three counts, three full counts to get that trigger hit, and anywhere in in those last three counts before you want it to go will work fine. So, but in the case of these songs like Africa or Bohemian Rhapsody, where the loops are not four and eight and stuff. Uh, then you have to get into a scenario where uh, the only thing I have found that works is to set it to one quarter. So we set this setting to one quarter, and that means while we're in 4-4 four, four time, uh, every, four, er, every four beats, one of those four beats, that's my trigger thing. So I've got one count, which is what I want. It's like, whoa, one count? That's not much, um, but that's what I want, because I know if I hit the trigger in that last four count, it's going to go. So let's watch. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, six, seven, eight. Six, seven. You see, so it's it's gonna go almost instantly. And so I realized really after I'd done a couple projects then like this, I do that a lot anyways. It's nice to have the cushy four counts. Um, if you can get them, if your song is set up like that, it's nice to have the cushy four and the room to, you know, hit that and get your other stuff set and get ready to change to the next part of the song. But if you uh, if you don't, it's not the end of the world. Like, it's totally fine to hit that. You know, I, I often find myself, even when I have cushy cushy counts like that, like a four, a four count uh, window to hit, I still find myself waiting till the last like oh my god here comes the chorus like, i got better change and i'm like Burr, find my thing and boom i just hit it at the last minute i can't tell you how many times i've hit a trigger i don't even know how i, I was in time but it somehow made it um but that uh you know it's, it's part of the, it's part of the whole game um it, but that's a very important thing to keep in mind is that setting up there that quantization menu setting and what you have it on one bar one quarter those are the only two settings I really use. So uh, back over to the push. We are, uh, these cursor arrows are obvious. They just move stuff around the cursor. These are your launch buttons. These are also your repeat divisions. So if you start doing a repeat on MIDI notes, and I'll show you that in just a second, um, that's what those are for. And then down this side, we have our session note layout, and we'll, I'll talk a little about those two. Note, they go together, note and layout, and scale will appear too when we press uh, note. And get on a MIDI channel scale will now appear too, and so we'll talk about those in just a second. We got page buttons down and about, shift and select. So here's a here's a fun one. If you press shift uh, or select, no, yeah, there it is. Shift and then press one of your keys. You'll see all that stuff just whoa, changed colors. That's how you change the colors of these guys. Which how easy is that? So if I do shift and I can even do the whole row, I think, by doing that. Nope, we do one at a time. So shift that, boom, now it's blue. Shift that. So that's how fast we can go through and change the colors. 
Um, so that's that. Select button lets you select clips, which you look up in your display and it changes between and you go, oh, cool. I see what I'm working on now. Easy peasy. And that's all of our buttons. So uh, let's get into these. Repeats, notes, sessions. If you get on a MIDI channel, so now we're on piano, right? I got on piano because I, I pressed and held this at the top. Long click, record enabled. Arm is in the way, sorry. Long click, uh, unenabled. Long click, enabled. Long click, una unabled. Disengaged. I don't know. What's the word? Who knows? And so let's turn it on. Now we can click on note and all this appears. And you go, whew, cool. Only some of them are appearing. OK, that's because of the scale setting. So look over here again, scale. These are buttons you want to know. Um, scale, set it up here. I always leave it just set to C major usually. But you know you can set any of these cool, fun scales. And this key right here, this button, toggles between whether you see everything or whether you see what's in key, between in key and chromatic. So the colored ones are your octaves. I'm going to reach over here so I can press my sustain pedal back. It's over here for my piano. You can't even see it. It's off the thing. But we go. So you're pretty much guaranteed when you're doing that. And uh, if you're playing the lit up notes, that these are all going to be pretty much, you know, like good notes, as I like to say. And so uh, it's also a fun way to just play different stuff than you normally would. And so that's that thing, right? And you can change your keys. Each one of these buttons all around the thing that correspond. It's very obvious what this stuff does. You change your key. Um, and so if you're on drums or something like that, though, you want to have all of the colors kind of open. So we'll click back to session view. One press on session, long press on your drum track. And there's my drums. So I go back to note by hitting this. Boom, there's my drums. <laughs> Repeat is on. I can know because it's blinking and because I'm pressing these and it's not really responding. So turn repeat off. Ah, there we go. So you can do some drums like that. Now, if we press scale and put it back in that thing like we had before, that's not going to be all that useful for drums. It changes everything. So that's just maybe me personally, but I like to have it back to here where I know everything is where it should be. And write that strum. So let's talk about the other views. There's this layout button here as well. So uh, under the layout button, the it's a three toggle view button. So under the first one, I'm not sure what that is. So we skip right over it. The next one, that's a step sequencer though. So these are steps that you're looking at in the drum thing. Let me solo the drums. Like, I need to solo me too, probably first. Ah, oh, it's just a little hi hat thing happened. Let's go to the next group where there's more drums. We'll press on note. Oh, I deselected it. I deselected it, so we have a lot going on um, in this one. And so what we're looking at, the white ones are blanks, on the bottom is our instrument, and on the top is our step sequencer. A step sequencer is a sequencer that goes beat to beat through the whole entire thing of your loop or bar or whatever. And as you look at it, it will light up. So you'll see a green light start rolling across. See that green light? And when it passes over the stuff you fit, there you go. So. Um, this is going to show you one drum at a time, basically, and your drums are down here. So if I hit the kick, it's now that's showing me the kick, and it was probably already showing me the kick. Then the snare, or it's put them all together. And there's the hi-hat. So you should see all that stuff lighting up green whenever it, you know, kind of comes off. So I'm going to hit the snare. And I'm going to say, I want to add some more, like, snares. Uh, 
yeah, you get the idea. It's a step sequencer, you know. Uh, play around with you. It's just another way to do the same stuff, you know. Like, there's eight ways to do everything, and Ableton is absolutely no different. There's eight ways to do everything while Boomer gets comfortable. Get comfy over there, Boomer. Um, and so, the another th cool thing about the drums, um, let's, let's go up to a blank loop spot up here. And um, we'll turn on, let's go back to a, the other view. So we're going to start recording. I'm going to check my uh, fixed length, have it set to one bar. I'm going to hit record once, hit record twice. Now it is recording. Now it can start recording. I'm going to turn my clicker on. It's just looping. I can wait for it to come back around. One, two, three, four. I can let you hear the click. One, two, three, four. Go back to push. Three, four. So we've got our loop. We can see it's there. We're ready to put something into it. So now we've got some kicks in there. And some snares, right? <clears throat> I'm going to press the record button, make it stop recording. So now we're just auditioning whatever's going to come back. And here's where we play with the loop, with the repeat button. Go over here and press the repeat button. Now you see these light up over here and they're divisions. So I'm going to press and hold my hi-hat button because now we're in repeat mode. It's repeating one-eighth. Eighth notes. Nice. Now I can switch between the other divisions and go back to eight and basically do fills, right? Watch. How cool is that? And that's the repeat button, right? So, uh, you know, you'll totally use that. Everybody does. It's the coolest thing ever. What else can I think to tell you about the push? Like, not much. If I haven't just now talked about it, you probably don't need to worry yourself with it, like, right now. I mean, that's pretty much the long and short. You've got two plugs in the back for ports. Um, I plug a... Uh, some controller. I don't remember. One of these, maybe a damper pedal or something to hook up to something, but... You know, and then one of them is a dedicated button switch, which can do, like, I think the stop and starting. But, you know, everybody's setups are uh, a bit different as to the controllers and the triggers and the buttons that they have set up. But the bottom line is, is that almost any controller is going to work with Ableton. Almost any controller is going to be super easy to set up with Ableton. So, you know... Get something, buy something used from a friend, you know, who knows, any kind of MIDI controller, um, if you want a little more control over your stuff. Get it, hook it up, see what happens, play around. You will have a blast, I'm sure. And, uh, you know, meanwhile, don't, uh, you know, don't go crazy. If you get, like, stalled out on, on some silly little things in Ableton, just look around a little bit on the YouTubes, and you might find a quick answer. Uh, and, you know, if you don't... Uh, look me up you can find you can find me and you can find my email without too much difficulty probably on the internet man send me a message if you're stumped about something i can probably unstump you and i'd be happy to do so so uh that's that's it i think that covers kind of everything and uh if it didn't oh well too bad hope you guys have a great day afternoon evening morning whatever you got coming at you i'm gonna go cheers